Chuck Marks has asked us, uh, he's observed, previously it has been mentioned by us pretty much that Hollywood takes period kilts, makes period kilts too muted, dark, and so that they kind of blend in with the surroundings, very just dark and drab. Generally not as bright as some of the paintings depict. Do you feel that the Glen Affric tartan, which we now have access to, <clears throat> actually supports that viewpoint? Or at least for the average wearer, were more muted colors actually more common than we think? Uh, and uh, Carla McLaughlin was asking uh, about how they figured out what the colors were. So I think we could we can touch sure. on both of those things in the process of answering this. Sure. If only we had an example of the Glen Affric Tartan. Oh wait, yes we do. Um, <clears throat> I would say. Yeah, I think Hollywood's gotten it wrong to a degree, but they're playing into a stereotype that people want to believe or that they think is true in that everything in the Dark Ages was dark. Everything pre-1800s was old and, and muddy and dirty and, and, and browns Drab. and grays. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, this is the Glen Affric Tartan. They took a, a, a painstaking process of... Now, this isn't obviously the actual piece. Um, this is the recreation <laughs> the of the actual, actual piece. Yes, I'm just throwing it around. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, we got it here. It's only 500 years old. Yeah, you know. Hey, there's a spill in the kitchen <clears throat> I want to wipe up. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the they, they, they went through a painstaking <clears throat> process of an acid bath and, and some other kind of cleaning solution over 14 weeks or something like that yeah. to strip out the peat staining that was in the actual piece of cloth. They carbon dated it. They did all this, a lot of research on a piece of cloth to make sure that they were representing the colors. And they, they went through uh, uh, testing of the dyes that were used to try to figure out the materials that were used in the dyes in the cloth. Yep. Um, Chemical so, testing, microscopic photography, um, yeah, again, a lot of cleaning processes, uh, and with both acidic and alkaline solutions to remove the peat and the tannins and stuff that were deposited on the fibers from the soil, basically stripping all that away first. So they had a pure sample because the peat, the presence of the peat would have uh, contaminated the carbon 14 dating also. Yep. So first that, and then all the chemical testing and microscopic photography and all this kind of stuff. So yes, proceed. Yeah. So Sorry. this is <clears throat> this is essentially the a, a reasonably accurate, as best as can be done scientifically, mm -hmm. representation of what the tartan would have looked like. Um, are there examples of of tartans from the 1700s, 1600s that were you know more colorful, or were they all browns and grays and drab? And you know, there's lovely filth down here, Stuart. Um, to quote Monty Python. <laughs> Didn't know we had a king. I thought we were an autonomous collective. Um, there, there's a there's a painting by uh, of uh, uh, Lord Mungo Murray where he's yep. wearing a tartan that mm -hmm. is yellow and red with a bunch of different stripes in it. That the colors of yellow and red look very very similar to this. Yeah, it's something that we you know put together recently when we got this this question. In. That particular painting is the one. It's from it's between 1668 to 1700. Yeah. Um, now that painting, of course, I think we're looking at unrestored versions of the painting. So it was probably actually brighter colors in real life, but the palette is very similar to what you're seeing here. Now that's about 150, 175 years after this specimen, which is from the, uh, the 1520s to 1600, probably 1520s based on the, the carbon 14 dating, but the 16th century, AKA 1500s for sure. So now the question that I have is um, fashion trends. Could there have been a fashion trend somewhere during the 1500s to, to 1800s or early, you know, late 1700s um, where there was browns and grays and more drab colors? Sure. Um, fashion nowadays is, you know, almost seasonal or what's the color of the year or what's the, you know, what's the, what's the in thing right now? And it's a lot more cyclical with fast fashion. Um, now back then, you know, 1500s, 1600s, there would have been trends within it as well, whether it's colors, whether it's patterns, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, but 
I don't think it would have necessarily been of the year. It may have been of the decade and it would have moved mm-hmm. slower. Mm-hmm. The question is, how slow would it have moved? Would it like, would these be popular colors for a hundred years or for 50 years or for five years? How fast would fashion have moved? Mm-hmm. Answer that. You're asking me? Go ahead. I'm uh, asking you. I have no idea. Seven and a half years. Exactly. Good number. Per color. Perfect. That's the answer. Eric has it. Done. Um, I think there's potential for that, as we have talked about earlier. The uh, But the other factor is economics. Um, it is Hollywood getting it wrong still? Yes. I'm sorry. I really still think that they tend to make things darker and more drab than they actually were. Now, was everyone dressed in bright colors? No. Um, We have a a strong suspicion, based on what evidence there is, that the brighter color tartans were mostly the province of people of means. Uh, The poorer you were, the more likely it was that you needed your clothing fast, and you needed it practical, and you didn't have access to all of the uh, herbs and dyes and minerals, you know, that, that came from other parts of the country or other parts of the world to make those really cool colors you have a couple here because we got some woad that grows around here and we got some we got some we got lots of uh, uh nettles that grow over here about down down in the valley so we can make these colors or matter or whatever yeah thing. yeah but some of these other colors that are harder to get we don't have and you know what it's easier if i just use some wool from this sheep who's kind of you know tannish colored white colored, and then we have some that this we have you know harvey over here who's a charcoal color and if i use those I can get some colors that way. So the poorer you are, the less color you may have had. We know that richer people had more color, but it was not as drab as people think. Um, and and even with the color, there's a variety of sources that came into it. We know that um, from the analysis that um, one of the colors in this, at least, you know, the the brown, uh, is from the undyed natural wool of a sheep. That color came from just the wool itself. Um, the, uh, the greens and blues, um, are probably woad or indigo, uh, most likely woad in my opinion. Um, the other colors are not as sure on, but they are definitely dye materials that were available in the area. It's more a question of the time and the effort that goes into using the dyes to make the cloth. It's the, it's the extra effort of having to go through all those steps. Okay. So, you know. That, that's what we're talking about is economics. The other thing that people don't always keep in mind nowadays is the fact that you very often inherited clothing. A good garment would be passed down to your son or daughter. Very often, if it was a stitch garment, you would be deconstructing it and reconstructing it into something that was more fashionable. But the cloth itself was passed down often through several generations. So things absolutely moved more slowly. Um, I think it's more about social station and economic station and where we do have pictorial evidence not the not the 1500s like this but for the 1600s and especially the 1700s they're bright colors i mean if you watch outlander and think that everybody's running around in those really drab tartans that they show that's not correct i mean look at the freaking portraiture from the age and they're just blazing with color look at the culloden uh extant culloden jacket Mm -hmm. you know it's it's nice rich colors so I still think Hollywood gets it wrong. They're getting better, but I still think they get it wrong. I I will I, 100%, end of sermon. No, no, I, I no, not not the end yet. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away, brother. I'm just getting warmed up. Testify. <clears throat> Amen, brother. Hallelujah. Um, the I'm I'm going to go at the color and expense angle from the other end. It's don't think of it as the the, the trap that I've fallen in is, and it, it kind of had a light bulb moment just there. Is it's not that, hey, I'd like to weave a tartan. Therefore, I want this red and this blue and this purple and this green. So I don't care what it costs, weave it versus I want a tartan, but I can't afford those colors. So weave these ones. Don't think of it that way. It's the mill, the person weaving the actual cloth is saying, okay, I'm gonna use this red, this blue, this green, and I'm gonna do this design. And now 
I'm going to make one that's going to be more time efficient, more cost efficient, and I'm just going to use the natural green, or excuse me, the natural brown and the natural black and the natural uh, cream kind of color ecru that I have available, and I'm going to make up a pattern within that. So here's the two that I'm going to offer. One didn't need dyeing, and I could do it a lot faster, and it was all local stuff versus something that was you know, let's say local dyes and then one that's more uh, elusive or, you know, this is from India. This is from, you know, this are, you know, a trade route kind of dyes. So I'm going to offer three different options. One far flung dyes, one local dyes, one non-dyed. Mm -hmm. And those are going to be yeah. their three price points of this one's the most expensive. This one's a midland, you know, a medium expensive. And this one's a less expensive for people who can't afford to have it dyed, but they still need cloth. They still need clothing. So that's kind of how I just, you know, light bulb thought about it is, okay, well, great. Now as a, as a proprietor, as a mill, as someone who's selling this stuff, I can offer different options. I'm dropping the cloth. Sorry, oh, no. buddy. Um, I can offer different options within it. And, but that's more, again, the KISS rule, the mm -hmm. Occam's razor, how it probably came about versus people custom yeah. you know, requiring things who didn't have a budget. They would just buy what's available. And yeah. the cheapest thing available is non-dyed local sheep. Mm -hmm. um, now that, I think I think you're right there, although that does post-date this particular specimen with Glen Affric because Glen Affric was definitely homemade. Yes. It was drop spun wool. It was definitely, you know, produced in a home, a household setting, let's say, not an industrial setting. Well, it so. was also a very, very fine example of drop spindle. Yep. It is also a very fine example of, you know, of different things. We know the wool came from several different sheep, which also, which implies that they were picking out the best wool yes. for this. This was a garment that was made for somebody who had the means and who was important enough to warrant it. The boss. Yes. Basically. So, yeah. Yeah. Another reason why you should buy it, because you want to look like a boss. Glenn Afric from USAKilts.com. Available now. Um... <laughs> If history is your thing and you have an appreciation for all things old that are new again, go check out the Glen Affric tartan over at usakilts.com. It is the world's oldest tartan, Scottish tartan, and one that has been faithfully reproduced by House of Edgar. And it's available right now at usakilts.com.